Thanks, everyone. Um, I, you'll have to uh, just go to, I'll, I'll save the story, but Angry Weasel, I'll just get this out of the way first. Been around for a long time. It just, you'll have to go there and there's a story there. I tell, I explain it all. It's a long, long story. So I know what you're thinking. Why is a guy from Microsoft talking about listening to customers? <laughs> it's, like, it's on your face. I can see it. Vista. Yeah. Um, I'm going to let you know our secrets. And I'll let you know that it's something we're working on getting better at. Like anything else, we want to get better. I'll let you know what we do. And here's the real secret. I'm going to give you a bunch of secrets of different things we do. But they're not that hard to do yourself, almost all of them. So always, you can get better data from your customers. So tester, customer advocate, yeah? Remember some of you? You are the customer. Tester is the customer. Who says, ah, no, you're not. You're the tester. You're not the customer. The tester is not the customer. You're the tester. The customer is different. I'm going to teach you how to act like the customer and pretend to be the customer. But first things first, you are not the customer. All right, let me tell you a little bit of story about me. About 12 years ago, I had just finished uh, shipping a, a big Microsoft product. That reverb's cool. Um, I was, uh, oh, I've been at Microsoft about five years, three or four, maybe four years, um, doing pretty well. It was the last version of that product they were ever going to do. So I moved on to a different team. I was actually testing uh, video capture drivers on Windows, what was called NT5 at the time, ended up being Windows 2000. It was really cool. I got to have TV tuners and cameras. There were three cameras in existence, uh, USB cameras in existence at the time. So it's kind of on the cutting edge and it was fun. But after about six months, um, got a call from our general manager saying that he had just got out of a meeting with marketing. Funny how marketing comes up in these keynotes. Well, marketing had said, hey, we did some customer research, and it looks like we should do one more version of this, this, this thing you're working on. And he told me, he said, we want you to come be part of the team and do a bunch of this really cool stuff. And uh, marketing has it all laid out for us. And you know, marketing, they're connected with the customer, right? Is marketing the customer? Maybe. Let's find out. So marketing laid out this plan for us. They told us, here's what you need to do. Here's what customers want. They told us, this is so great. They told us what they wanted. They told us what other part software at Microsoft we had to integrate into our product. That was cool. It was great. And, and when we had to ship, of course. So we got that all worked out. We went through our stuff, and we released. And. Uh, the ME in this case stands for I, what I always call internally, jokingly, uh, marketing edition. But it was really, um, that's this, my story of working on Windows Millennium Edition. Which, thank goodness for Vista to take some of the heat off that, right? <laughs> that was like a bad spot on my resume for years, but, um, but th that was really helpful. So lesson learned in hindsight from that is marketing doesn't know the customer either. Darn it. They're no help. Maybe they're a little help. All right, so what do we do today? And probably betas. How many of you do betas of your software? Head nods, hand waves, a lot. That's what we've done that at Microsoft for a long time. Worked on Windows 95, we had like six betas. We send betas out, we get feedback. Oh, I forgot some of the most famous betas in the world. Um, just I like little jabs at my Google buddies. Um, just keep it in beta forever, whatever. Um, so we send these betas out. And what kind of feedback do we get from the betas? Come on, interactive, yell something out. Bugs, right? Icky bugs. And we get them in, and customers give us lot, these beta customers give us lots of bugs. And we look at the bugs, and what do we do with them? Come on, we bring in Bob the Builder to fix them. <laughs> We're going to fix these. I thought we do the beta to get feedback so we can fix this stuff. People have kids? Some of you? What does Bob the Builder say? That was weak. One more time. 
And the answer is? Yes. No, it's too late to fix that. <laughs> or Bob may say, no, that's by design. So you give Bob one more and he says, I think the user is confused. And we don't fix that stuff. We get a bunch of data, we go, well, I don't know. That's, I don't see any trends in there. So that data, a lot of times, isn't very actionable, at least by itself. We get some bugs, we look at them, great. It's not, it's just, we can't do enough with that. We've done thumbs up for a long time. That's like, that's like customer feedback 1.0, 0.9, beta. I don't know, it's not, not what we can do, not the best we can do. So what else we can do? We want to find out what they're really thinking. And I, unfortunately, I don't have the pull at Microsoft I need, but I've brainstormed about this for a long time. I thought, what can we do to get better customer data? Because the bugs aren't giving us enough actionable feedback. We get the betas, we make fixes, and customers still aren't happy. So. I brainstorm possible solutions. Brainstorming is a good thing when you want to come up with a creative new idea, right? First idea, ship someone with every copy of software. <laughs> you don't rule out the absurd when you're brainstorming. Every, good idea, every idea is a good idea, or there are no bad ideas. I'm not sure which way it is. Um, I, did, um, I looked into outsourcing this to make it a little cheaper, but it still wasn't feasible, um, so I had to move on. And here's one that I still think will work. They tell me it's not feasible, but USB mood rings. <laughs> now think about this. You take, you get your software, you install it, you plug in your USB mood ring, you put it on, and we can track when you're pissed. It's great. <laughs> and when you're happy too, and we can like correlate that with screenshots and I really don't see the downside for this one, but shot down as well. Um, so real, the, the better answer is we're gonna collect more data from customers. And what's the be what kind of data do you really wanna see the most? When do you, well just here, let me phrase that differently. How many of you have ever sworn at your computer? Good people, and, wh and why? Same reason Bill did in this photo. Not a happy guy. Um, one said, this isn't the right screenshot, I couldn't find it, but um, when I was working on the Windows 98 team, Bill was giving a demo at Comdex. And USB 2.0 had just come out, and he was, plugging, he was showing how cool he could plug in all these devices and it blue screened on him. And the stories about Bill being someone who gets very, very mad are true. And I was part of a team that had to look at the video of him, and you know, and this was 1997, so you know, these fancy CSI type video editing things weren't around. But we had to look at the screenshot behind him and try to look at the call stack and figure out what messed up. <sighs> Thank goodness he's just doing his philanthropy stuff now. No, so we want to get this crash data, but it isn't just Bill. Um, crashes hurt everyone. You lose data, right? That's bad. Blue screens. Who, who likes blue screens? Just this guy over here. Girl. Sorry, I just, it's bright, it's a light, it's no offense. I'm sorry, I owe you something. Um, so we get these crashes, but we're good, we're going to collect this data. We have, you've seen this dialogue, something like this. This, you can read between the lines, it says, Windows just rebooted on you, and um, we're sorry. <laughs> can you, can, we don't have anything for you. We want to take stuff from you. We want to get some data from you. Or this one for an application. Stopped working. Now, notice these are different from the old ones. Back in Windows XP, the dialogue looked more like this, where you had a button that said, one said send error report, one said don't send error report. Which button do you click? Everybody clicks don't. You know why? Because stupid, sorry, calm. The UI, you click send error report, then you had to click OK in another dialogue, and all this grinding and wait screens went on. It was ridiculous. Of course you click don't send. So now, of course, you, know, you go back, we just, we just take it from as long as you opt in. Um, so what happens when you click that button? Anybody know? Nothing. It's a placebo. <laughs> uh, no, I'll tell you what happens. 
Um, now that would be a secret, wouldn't it? We don't do anything. No, let me tell you what we do. Um, we have a team in uh, Microsoft Research in Cambridge who uh, has been looking at this data for a long time and this is kind of what they've come up with. Operating and system errors. Sorry, my fault. Well, thanks to our Windows XP error reporting dialog box, we do. As a result, we have reduced system errors in our consumer products by over 80%. The success of this feature has encouraged us to extend and enhance it for you, the professionals. We know that your job depends on stable systems, and as our research has shown, the pain of system failure is real. We believe that if our customers are experiencing pain, Microsoft employees should share that pain with them. This is where We Share Your Pain, or WSIP, comes in. It's really fundamentally about making us as programmers, as developers, the techie side of things, if you like, making us more accountable to the people that are using our products. An error box comes up like this one, for example. What the WSIP system does is it actually analyzes the stack sent back by that error dialog box. It uses that to identify the person, the actual programmer that wrote the piece of code that's caused the problem. We can now see that it's uh, Mike Pulteney in the Active Directory's team. We can now decide on what way we want to express the frustration he's caused us. So we can choose one of the options here. I'm going to choose the jab. I just actually, um, I'll just turn up the, uh, the volume here because we can hear him as well. It's all part of the experience. And here we go. Ooh. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he's still suffering from that right now. Let's take a look at the technology behind this great breakthrough. The first feature I'm going to talk to you about is called the Micro Stun. This is connected to um, a cranked up TENS machine. The electricity will generate through these arm sleeves. Micro impacts, okay. Um, four stages. The back of the chair releases back and thrusts forward into the person sitting into the chair. Yeah, very good. Micro jab. Two needles released from the bottom of the chair into the fleshy part of the buttocks. Unorthodox in some ways, but it's very effective. It's more people related. Microsoft has got the best programmers, we hope, in the world. And this program will help them to share, understand uh, the users in a very direct way. We want to experience what the user goes through. I'm really keen to um, get in touch with the, with the customers. The more commitment that we can show um, and the better we can get by doing this, then I think that's good news for everybody. The future also looks exciting. We are developing WSIP Ejection, a staff motivation feature that pinpoints programmers with poor bug ingress records. Amazingly, while making this film, we witnessed the first ever WSIP ejection at Microsoft UK office. Microsoft. So that's what happens. Now, now, aren't you, all the times you didn't click that button, thank you. So what, what really happens from an entertainment side isn't nearly as exciting, but is very exciting if you're kind of geeky. So we take this data from all these crashes. Um, it's a very big number with lots of zeros per day, which is great because um, that means there's lots of people for me because lots of people are using Windows. That's great. Um, so a very large number every day, so we get very good sample of these to come in. They're not all Microsoft crashes. We, we collect crashes for anybody that crashes. We're that nice. Um, we collect these, and then um, a friend of mine looks through them all as they come in. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, good, good case for automation. We actually do very good uh, fuzzy matching of we get the call stacks, we get the modules that are loaded. We can automatically bucket errors together say these are with a high likelihood of certainty, all these crashes from all over the world are caused by the same thing. So you put things into buckets. Um, Non-Microsoft companies can use uh, uh, winqual.microsoft.com. They can get their, say your Joe's software. You can sign up and have your crash reports. Microsoft will collect them and send them off to you. It's very nice. 
So we collect all these things. Bucket them. Most teams have a, they'll set a threshold. Uh, maybe not every crash that comes in will automatically be entered into their bug database, but over a certain threshold. Usually it's, you know, if it's a small product, maybe 10. If it's a large product, maybe 100. Um, just it's set at a rate so they can get uh, a handleable number of errors. But what happens is, there is the really cool part. We get all this data, and every single time for every single product at Microsoft, whether on Windows, Office, um, uh, Visual Studio, anywhere, we always get a curve that looks like this. The highest percent, you know, there's, there's a percentage of bugs that cause, like the top five or 10 percent of the bugs cause 80 percent of the crashes people are seeing. What does this do? Gives you a target. Let's fix the top part of the curve. It's not too hard, it's not rocket surgery. We fix those, um, and a lot, oftentimes we'll have, we'll try and fix these bugs for betas. Someone got the rocket surgery joke. Um, and then we'll fix more, and we'll fix more, and this curve kind of keeps sliding up, but we're able to kind of get most of the stuff. But you're thinking, why does your stuff still crash when I get it? We don't try to make it crash. Um, as, you, as you guys all know, configuration testing is, is very difficult. Um, just the massive number of configurations. So we have to do more. This is a good start. This gets us a good start at crashes. We can set goals around betas, as, as I mentioned, and we can fix at least most of them. I have a great story about, um, I believe it was a version of Word. I think it was Word. Well, for this story, we'll say it's Word. Went through their beta, shipping all this stuff. Crash rates go down, 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 down through. They do another beta. They, they go down and down. Then they ship, and the crash rates immediately go up. Because all of a sudden now, here's another problem with betas. Now that you release, all of a sudden it's a different class of users using your software. It's different people than were in your beta. They use it differently. So you need to think about who's in your beta programs. Um, one thing we do at Microsoft for things like Word is we make sure many of our lawyers are on uh, an early adopter internal dog food beta programs. Why? Because lawyers use things like Word in ways you can never imagine. So think about those edge cases of your customers, see if you can find those people for your betas. All right, still not enough. Let's do some more. Um, we have this thing uh, we call the Customer Experience Improvement Program. Internally, we call it SQUIM, which stands for a bunch of different things. Nobody remembers what it originally stood for. But if I mention the word SQUIM, it's just me talking internally. But it's called the CEIP, and um, you have easier way to explain it. You've seen dialogues like this in Microsoft products, and like this, and like this. And hopefully, you opt in. Um, it is, we, we are very careful of privacy and don't collect data, but we do collect very cool stuff about how you use your software. And this is probably the most powerful thing we have. Here's um, just a couple examples. I um, wonder how many, if we're going to change the way, we're going to do some optimization around the way documents are stored in the My Documents folder. Well, how many documents people store in there? I don't know. Well, now we can go to, just go look that up, basically. Um, media player team may go, or the Windows media player may say, we want to optimize the user experience around um, uh, playing DVD, playing DVD audio, play, sorry, audio, playing, playing DVD movies. How many of our users use media player for that versus another app on their computer? We can't tell the other app, but we can tell of users of media player how many use it for playing videos. How many do play primarily MP3 versus WMVs? We can look at you know, display settings. And what this enables us to do, this is probably, as I mentioned, very empowering for testers. Because now, when you're like, you guys do like the bug, we call it bug triage, but the bug, you know, kind of does this bug get fixed kind of thing. And you have that conversation, you know, and as Elizabeth said, it's a bug. No, it's not. It's a bug. No, it's not. Well, it doesn't matter to this person. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, well, now you can find out if it does matter. So you say you find, oh, say you find a crash. But it's not like that crash every time crash. It's a crash that only happens in this really, because we're testers, we find these things out. It's a crash that only happens in this really cool configuration where we, in, where we have this special video card on this one machine and this other software program installed, and then it'll crash sometimes. Well, and you go, wow, shoot. 
I wonder how many customers have that configuration. We can go look it up. Now we can go, this, this will impact five users out of you know, 40 million, or it'll impact like you know, 10% of them. Helps you make those decisions. And if I may rant a little bit, just a little brief side rant, um, this kind of falls into that, it's the way we've always done it category with bugs. Yeah, um, we have priority, usually like three levels. This is, the, this is, maybe it's just at Microsoft, but I've talked to enough people externally have the same sort of thing that I have to say something about it. We have priority, which is like when you fix it, and severity, which is like, you know, how severe it is. That's not enough information to make a decision on whether to fix something. What's the user impact? And maybe we don't measure that because we can't measure it. So we've got to find ways to measure it. Um, so brief little rant there. Um, what's another one? See if I can think of a good one. Oh, here, here's one that happened in, um, in Windows 7. There was an obscure uh, dialogue in one of the control panel applets, and um, I, it's, I always say obscure because I can't remember which one it was. Um, there was a question late in the cycle of, you know what, we just want to remove this, these settings from here because I, I don't think people are using them. Well, that's, you know, that's, I don't think, I don't know, how do you get the right sampling? We can just go look at the CEIP data and tell how many people use it. Um, you can use it to uh, prioritize scenarios. What are the areas of the product the, um, that customers are using the most? Um, is your application confusing? How often do people open a dialog and cancel it within five seconds? No, they can't find what they're looking for. Um, so very powerful, we use this a lot. Um, we also use it in a little different way, but in really cool ways in our games group. This is um, not yet released product. This is Crackdown. And this is showing where, this is actually just showing where users are finding a certain object, and you can overlay these objects, but where users are finding a certain object on the map. So testers can use this and go, okay, these are where the objects are, but there should be some over here, or they're too close here. You can start making some choices about doing your testing. Um, we can track, uh, found in games, tracking audio events is very interesting. Um, in this case, we're tracking the, the, don't worry about reading the writing, we're tracking the top audio events that occur. The top one that occurs is this, uh, it's the constant is, is break, foot, screech. It's the guy's walking and he stops and goes, Arr! and it's happening an awful lot. And maybe that's by design, maybe it's not, but it allows us to ask questions. What's more interesting is looking at the inverse of this and looking at the least played audio. One of the objects in Crackdown is to uh, activate these beacons. And I can look at this from, these are, there's multipliers on here, but I can look at this from thousands of users' data and see this play beacon activate sound. It's hardly ever happening. That tells me either there's one of two things that I can just go investigate and figure it out. Either the sound's not playing right, the easy fix, or users can't figure out the objective of the game. So we want to go look a little deeper there. These, these are kind of guide us. So in addition to giving us ammunition in, the, um, uh, in those triage meetings, they can kind of guide our testing. Um, new game coming out in a couple of weeks called Alan Wake. Gamers in here? A couple of you, Alan Wake's, it's like supposed to be really, really cool. Um, here's just something where we've tracked, um, as players move through the map, everywhere, I don't know how well you can see up here, there's, the screen's a little small, but there's red dots everywhere where um, there's been performance lag in the frame rate. So we can spot and we start overlaying hundreds and thousands of users over this and see if there are trends in where um, performance data are happening, performance issues are happening so we can go target some extra testing in there. So we don't have to go test for performance there. We can let people just kind of play the game and let them guide us to what should be tested further. So really cool stuff going on in the games group there. Still not enough information. Need to get more. What's missing? We have bugs, so you get a little bit of verbatim feedback there. Hey, by the way, one thing about bugs, um, I keep on reading articles, and I even wrote some about it in, in How to Software at Microsoft about writing good bug reports, right? If you guys probably, some of you had training on this. So if, it's, if writing a good bug report is difficult enough that we need some sort of training or a paper or something on it, you know, how good of bug reports do our customers give us? Without that training, they don't give us this, it's like, didn't work, broken. So we need, so 
those aren't very actionable. We need some more uh, verbatim feedback. So many of our beta products at Microsoft, here's another very easy thing to implement, this send feedback button. How simple is that? And I'll kind of show you actually a little bit how that works. Um, here's, a, here's my product, Office Communicator. This is a beta. And there's a send feedback. I can just file a bug. Select a category. This, is a, this must be a collaboration issue. A little, little, bit of, little bit of use, and if they don't know, they can just, they don't have to enter it. Something there, I can give it a title and a little description. So, so far, not that exciting. Um, two things help us. One is, if I say text is garbled, I have an opportunity to send in a screenshot. With Windows 7, you can actually record a little video of what you're doing. It gives you more information to figure out what the user was going through. The extra part we do is we pull some, uh, some additional logs from your computer to find out if something went wrong. It happened to me yesterday. I had a conference call in my hotel room. Uh, I lost the presentation. Audio and video kept going, but I lost the presentation, couldn't reconnect. I just entered a bug from there. And a beta customer could do this too. Entered a bug from there. It grabbed the logs from my machine so it could figure out exactly what went wrong. I didn't have to go investigate. That can all get investigated automatically on the back end. So pretty cool stuff. Still not enough. Oh, and I also wanted to show out that Microsoft isn't the only company doing this. I was talking to Lynette Creamer about this uh, yesterday. And Adobe, when you crash on Adobe, Adobe products, um, you could enter data about why it crashed. Very nice. I like, I like this trend. And, it, and they're getting very actionable data there as well. Um, kind of the uh, send feedback plus plus version is this send a smile thing. Now we're getting into emotions, right? Um, Smiley face, happy face. Smiley face, frowny face. And what these do is these icons sit in the system tray. And Office has been um, pretty much the only application to use these at Microsoft um, uh, so far. But we're getting, oh, maybe, I, actually, I'm sorry. Never mind. Uh, Windows 7 used some of these for a while. Um, if you're really happy about something that happened, like, wow, that was super cool. We don't always get that feedback from bug reports. Somebody can click on the smiley face. We get a little, a, Screenshot, a little more data. If they're mad, they can do the frowny face. Um, on the back end, you know, it's actually it's a little bit what that dialogue looks like. Again, hard to see on this screen. Um, we get a lot of information. Kind of have to parse it manually, but it's all right. We get actually starting to get more actionable and trending information from customers. We can do some matching of screenshots to find everybody sending in pictures of the same uh, application running. But over time, we start to get some good trending data that helps us figure out when customers are mad. It's not as good as the USB mood ring, but we're starting to get some good data. Um, let's talk about something else. How do you know, um, remember, you're not the customer, right? So how do you know what's important to test? Just test everything? You have scenarios for your application, like some key scenarios or use cases, things like that. Which ones do you test? Which ones are most important? Which ones really, really have to work? Do you know? Or do you guess? I think you guess. We'll find out here. So we do, um, another thing we do is voting. Well, um, this is a quick and cheap way to get uh, data from customers on what scenarios they think are most important. And we just give them a big list of pairs of things to vote for, randomly selected. So it would look like this which is stuff from a uh, communicator. Which scenario is more important to your daily work? Do you want to reply to a missed call or invite someone else to a conversation? Which one is more important the way you do work? Which one do you want to do? Which one's more important to you? Which one's more important to you? Which one's more important to you? Um, because these are so quick, most people that go through and give us feedback give us 40 or 50. Some give us 100. We do 500, 1,000 beta users, do the math. We start getting a lot of data about what people, and kind of a good broad selection of people, want to do with the application. From that, we can prioritize. It, comes out, it looks a lot like that Pareto curve. We see that, oh, the thing they care about the most are this. The top 10 things they care about the most are this. We can prioritize our testing around that. We're not guessing anymore. Of course, that changes a little bit when we go to a wider audience, but we're not guessing anymore. 
that ends up being super valuable. Um, some other things we do, um, you saw the, the Twitter wall out here. Um, we get a lot of information from this thing called the internet, which is kind of catching on. You guys familiar with that? Um, uh, most of our products monitor Twitter. We look at uh, what people are tweeting about the app. We look at forums, um, not just the ones we own on msdn.com, but forums all over the place. We also have this Microsoft Connect site, connect.microsoft.com, where we, what do we do there? Um, if you go there, you'll see a ton of beta applications. It's kind of the way to, if you want to be an early adopter of a Microsoft application, there are forums and questions there. There are things like feature requests, where people can vote up features which is a really cool way of kind of getting feedback of somebody goes, hey, um, you know, this application should do this thing. Then other people can kind of vote on that and go, and, and, and yeah, that's really cool, that's really cool. And we start getting that feedback in real time from customers. Um, so we have a lot of testers who are pretty involved in kind of looking at this media across, uh, kind of across a variety of, uh, of uh, inputs. All right. It's almost beer time, right? Um, another thing we do is uh, a, these A-B experiments. Um, the idea is uh, fairly simple. Take um, what you do now, have a control set of half the people that do that, try something new in the other half and see what's better. Used a lot for web stuff. We have this uh, uh, experiment platform. I used at Microsoft, but it's not that hard to implement yourself. This group of IP addresses, or, or the users coming into this bank of servers get this experience. The users going to this bank of servers get this other experience. And you can collect data and figure out which one is actually getting more of the result you want. So you guys look like you need to stand up, so let's play a game. You ready? Everybody stand up. Uh, Simon didn't say, just, just kidding. Okay, and here's one of those things where going to uh, the stretch, that's good. Here's one of those things where uh, going to a larger audience um, will be interesting. I did this for a group of 30 or 40 people about two weeks ago. It worked perfectly. For this crowd, we'll see. We'll see. All right. Here's the way the game works. You're going to be the A-B readers. Hopefully we can read the screen up there. Um, if you vote for A, and the answer is A, you get to keep playing. If you're wrong, you don't get to keep playing. It's not that hard. Those are the rules. Clear? All right, who wants to win? Excellent. All right. If you don't even know what you win, what if it's something really awful? All right. Here's the first one. This is uh, uh, MSN Real Estate. The, um, the two choices are A is, I can put it on the other side. You guys can read this, but in case you can't see in the back, a is the one on your left. B is the one on your right. Raise your left hand if you think A wins. If you think A got more clicks. Your right hand if you think B wins. And leave your hands down if you think they're about the same. Everybody voted? I can't, I, like if you cheat, I'll have no idea, so just be honest and police those around you. All right, got to figure it out. Left hand for A, right hand for B. If you did not raise a hand, sit down. If you raised your right hand, sit down. Everybody else, you can keep playing. Wow, that was a differentiator, huh? A was about 8.5% better, which is out of a sample size of a pretty large sample size is statistically significant. So this, I can stop right here and say, do you understand why you need to get data from your customers and why you're not the customer? <laughs> I'm thinking of stopping right now, but I'm gonna go ahead and finish the game. The rest you can vote silently, but only if you're still standing you can be a winner. All right, round two. This is Office Online. Um, in A, um, you can tell the difference. So I, the, the way you can, the way you want to gauge success on these is generating revenue by clicking on that link. You know how ads work. Um, so 
let me see if I can describe these. A has a, uh, the big circle there you can click, and also over in the, in the middle section. And in B, you can click the green button or on the box of office. Same deal. Raise your left hand if you think A is better. Raise your right hand if you think B is better. And if they think they're about the same, leave your hands down. Everybody voted? Okay, if you did not raise a hand, sit down. Lost two. If you raised your right hand, sit down. Ah, it's getting down to the finals. All right, 64% better. I'm gonna ask again, do you think you're the customer? Yeah, I'm, that's, that's, that's my, one of my goals to convince you of today. Pretty significant difference. All right, the third and final round. How many do we have left here? One, two, three, four, five. Are you up? You're standing up right there. Okay, so five left. Six. All right, here we go. Round three. MSN homepage search box. This is the old MSN page. Sorry, my slides are old. Um, a, um, search box is taller um, as the magnifying glass icon. B, um, just has a big search button. Same voting. Raise your left hand if you think A is better. Raise your right hand if you think B is better. And don't raise any hand if you think they're about the same. If you raised any hand at all, please sit down. These two are actually the same. Is there anybody left at all? I'm um, a little sad. Because <laughs> you could have just stood up and done nothing and won. No, you would have sat down. That wouldn't have worked. Um, <sighs> All right. In some ways, that worked out better than I had imagined. And in some ways, I'm just a little bit sad. Because usually, it's like one person is like, yeah, I got this stuff. That's okay. It's a long day of testing knowledge, a little burned out. Um, the five of you that did make it to the, to the first two rounds, congratulations. Um, the last one's kind of a trick one because you're kind of feeling like, yeah, I'm getting this figured out. I'm going to roll along here. Um, but the trick is to trust the data. And, and sometimes you don't need to change for the sake of change. Change isn't that important. Um, and so, quick little recap. Uh, Windows error reporting. Um, I mentioned the stuff you could use. Windows error reporting, you can sign up for. If you're doing internal IT sort of applications, you can, uh, there's other ways to get a thing called corporate error reporting, CER. Um, there are ways to get that data through Windows for those of you on Windows platforms. I don't know what's available for Linux or Macintosh, sorry. Um, ask for feedback within your applications, right? It's not that hard to do. Um, scenario voting is, so easy to implement. If you're trying to figure out what's important, it's so easy to implement. Um, and also find ways, um, this, the one hard one to do outside of Microsoft, we have a big infrastructure for it, is to grab that data about you know, what buttons people are clicking when. Um, my advice to you though, if you do implement something like that, is just like anything else, it's easy to do wrong. Think about what action you wanna take from that data before you, uh, if, before you start collecting it what action you're gonna take. Don't just collect stuff randomly, collect stuff that's gonna be actionable. Um, A-B testing, as you can tell, is very powerful. Um, if you're doing uh, not huge scale applications, but like internal deployments of applications, very easy to do A-B testing um, even within a desktop application. Just deploy two slightly different versions to different people, collect some feedback, but again, um, if, not just because you can, but if you can make some actionable data based on that. And the big thing is, is again, you're not the customer, so stop guessing. Try and gather some data to help you make those choices. Um, couple links for you. I'll put these slides up on my blog and leave all the, um, uh, the social media stuff there. As um, Lee pointed out, um, both Adam Goucher and uh, Tim is maybe in here. Tim, Tim's right behind him. Uh, they're going to be signing beautiful testing tomorrow. Yes? 
So um, it's it's a very cool book. I'm very proud to be part of it. And also, um, if you look around the room, there's like 10 different authors of beautiful testing at the conference, which is really cool. Probably one of the reasons, Lee, why this is the best star ever, just an observation. Um, I think it's really cool stuff. And obviously, how we test software at Microsoft. Um, if uh, do I have like a, I have comments for questions, right? I plan on ending about 45. I perfect. I can do some questions before we stop. Anybody wanting to guess about something? Yes. Oh, you know what? I, I didn't mention usability testing um, because I, I had a slide in there for a while. I thought everybody's seen that F pattern slide, and everybody's it's 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 uh, we do it. I just didn't mention it. It wasn't as to me. It wasn't as cool as the rest of the stuff. But we do it. Yeah, in the back. Better yell. Oh my God, do we have data overload. <laughs> Terabytes of data. And in fact, I think that uh, the new role, emerging role in test is like this business analyst um, uh, information type person who actually knows how to look at that data properly. Think about how we've looked at bug data for all these years. We stare at bug data and we wait for the answer to come out and go, uh, and we're getting more of that. You're absolutely right, data overload, we are continually refining ways to get better at it. But for the most part, the things that help us are with the crash data and the scenario voting, it's always that Pareto curve. So that tell, that's actionable, we can make action on that. And with the user data, we use it not to discover things as much as to answer questions. And that allows us to do the right thing there. But you're right, it's a massive, massive amount of data. Great question. Anything else? All right, well, I'll be around today and tomorrow. And um, there's beer. Is there beer or just hors d'oeuvres? Beer. Excellent. All right, thanks, everyone. <laughs>